Well, hello there, my brothers and sisters. It's Josh Packard. Welcome to another episode of the Golden Image of Churchianity is a Lie. Thank you for joining me today. If this is your first time, I want you to know right off the bat, this has already been done. You've already been saved, and you always have been, and there's never been a time you weren't. Okay? Um, everyone still thinks this is about getting to heaven, and this is not the truth. There are... In the scriptures, there's nothing describing heaven, the afterlife at all, or hell for that matter. Everybody has all these ideas that they've gotten from fictional books like Dante's Inferno and whatnot, but there is no description. I mean, other than one is a place of, of torment, and then we'll call it, or, or one is a place of paradise. And that was actually before the cross. So what's left now um, is not what you think. Christ has purchased everything. He's reconciled everything. Heaven, hell, hell, earth, they've all been subdued by Christ. There is nowhere for you to go that is called this place of hell. I mean, you know, in hell, if you just it's really it's literally the place of death. That's all it is. It has it doesn't describe anything else. You know, there's the lake of fire, but the lake of fire isn't death or hell and the fact that Whenever you read the scriptures, it says death and hell are cast in the lake of fire. So you know that the lake of fire is neither death nor hell. And the lake of fire isn't down where we think hell would be. The lake of fire would be up where God is. Because everywhere you look in scriptures, where does the fire come from? It's always coming down out of heaven from God. And when you see the new Jerusalem descending out of God from heaven you're starting to see, well, something's a little different about this lake of fire. Especially when you see what the new Jerusalem is made out of, um, and it's everything that can abide the fire. So today I don't want to get into that topic, but if you ever want to chat on it, just let me know. Okay, <clears throat> today I want to talk to you uh, from the book of Titus. I don't think I've ever done a video on the book of Titus. I don't think I've ever heard a any, any sermons at all ever in my life on the book of Titus because it it's, it's kind of seems dry. It really does. Um, but you never hear of anybody teaching from Titus. And I, so today I was like, oh, what the hell? We'll talk out of Titus today. And it's very significant. I mean, I'm, I'm trying not to make light of the book of Titus because it is very, very uh, unique and uh, a piece of the whole. So, But anyways, let's let's get into it and see what it breaks down. Um, anyways, as always, I want you guys to know that Christ has done everything. Before we get into this, your the good works that the Bible's talking about are not for God's benefit necessarily. The good works are a reward for you. They're, uh, Paul is talking about how we want to lead good and holy lives in order to be a witness to those outside of us. However, a holiness is what causes a holy life and holiness isn't being like ha ah, ah, like you're some some amazing person and mystical holiness just means satisfied it means solid it means sober it means that you have you're settled and and you're you're like weaned from the tits there's no how do you say it there's no um agitation no fear you're settled, you're grounded, you have, it's like you're anchored. And that that's, that's the most important aspect of walking in Christ because it allows you, first off, to escape your lusts. Because the reason we had lusts um, is because we were empty inside and we needed something to fill that void. And so instead of God, instead of Christ, who was made for that purpose, I mean, we made, but you know what I mean? That's his purpose. We went off trying to seek from each other. So we went around to other empty people trying to beg and steal from them in order to get uh, some sort of sense of of peace or want or being wanted or to be um, included. I mean, you see that everywhere every single day. I mean, I, 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 I can't stress enough. People will murder their children on the altar of... of uh, convenience people will tat all over their body people will allow um, 
homosexual acts upon themselves. People will do all this stuff in order to just find a home. Because they're so, so, so broken inside. And they can't overcome it. And there's these little things that provide these temporary sources of, of inclusion and peace and, and joy for just a moment. And they'll do anything they can to do it. Whether it be drugs, alcohol, sex, um, anger, I mean, whatever it is. So I want you to know, the cure for that is righteousness. Righteousness is the affirmation of God's word that you are a child of God, that you are loved, that you already belong in the kingdom, that you're being you're satisfied in that whole so that you have no more need to serve your lusts. Not to say you're never going to screw up. You're going to fall back, you're going to fall forward sometimes, let's put it that way. You're always you're always just going to get back up and keep going. You're not going to be like others that get trapped and keep failing and falling backwards. You're 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 trying to climb a mountain right now and you're going to stumble and fall. And as you're stumbling and fall, it's only so you'll learn how to get back up. Okay? So, um, that being said, whenever you're looking at the book of Titus, remember, holiness is just satisfaction. You're satisfied. No more need for righteousness because you have faith in Christ and you're leaning upon His performance, not your own. So that hole inside of you is filled up because righteousness purges out sin because the righteousness is heavier it pushes it out of your heart and fills you okay being full is called holiness okay so when you're holy this is when you can do the works which god requires because you're not a sinner you're a saint those who are sinners are still judging themselves by their performance which they can never live up to and there's no authority in themselves in order to grant them peace. But when we, we, we lean on Christ, he's the king of kings and lord of lords. What he says goes. He has the authority to where you can actually believe your sins are forgiven. You're adequate before God and that he'll transform you as he wills. Okay? Keep this in mind. Because Titus, James, uh, James uh, these other books, if you don't know this, it'll condemn you. Because the Bible is a double-edged sword, just so you know. For those who are still subject to their sins and acknowledging the accusation of Satan, the Bible will further condemn you so that you, through the law, will die under the law. It makes your burden even more burdensome so you can see your need for Christ. But for those of us who have received his performance, that we lean upon him, now the Bible becomes life for us. What once used to condemn me now brings forth life. Now, I want you guys to see this. And it's, it's set up this way. The Bible is so amazing. And it's set up this way um, because people aren't even aware of what, their sin, what sin is. And they don't realize that the easiest way to test whether or not you're still underneath the dominion of sin is just look in the mirror. Are you, can you look at yourself and say perfect? Clean conscience? That you have nothing wrong with you that you couldn't change? And then if you lie to me and say no, then I'm going to point to your works. Well, then why are you wearing that? Why are you doing this? Why do you have your manicured beard? Why do you have, you know, whatever it is. Why do you, it, it, you everything you do tells on you. Why are you out trying to get laid? Why are you out trying to do drugs and drink? And, you know, why are you, or conversely, why are you still trying to act like you're good? Like the religious side of things. Because everybody knows the center side of things. You know, the drinking, smoking, chewing, you know, whatever, all that side, you know. Everybody knows about that side, but they don't realize that the other telltale sign of, of your being underneath the dominion of sin is your desire to be perceived as good. Always trying to fix yourself and to measure yourself and looking at yourself according to the image of your understanding and of those around you. There are some good, good people who are so fake. Their fakeness and all their efforts at trying to achieve righteousness show that they have not received Christ's righteousness. They're not holy. They're full of iniquity. They're not saints. They're sinners. Still in their own conscience. And they identify as such. And they'll tell you that you're still a sinner. Even though the whole entirety of scripture 
tells of how Jesus removed that sin. He's overcome it. That has been implied to you, applied to you in his overcoming. You are not a sinner. You are a saint. A sinner is someone who still doesn't have an atonement paid for them. So if you today are a Christian and you're calling yourself a sinner and teaching other people that they're still sinners, then you have denied Christ. Okay, I'm going to just keep talking. I'm long-winded here. But let's get ahead and jump right into Titus. And it's a really short book. I mean, it's only a couple pages. So we'll just kind of go through the whole thing if possible. Okay, <clears throat> let's start off with Titus 1.1. 1, 1. Is there even more than one chapter in Titus? I don't even know. I don't think so. I think it's just one chapter. Oh, no. There's three chapters. Three whole chapters for you. Okay. Paul, a servant of God. This is necessary for him to say. Versus the servant of men. Okay. And an apostle of Jesus Christ. Saying he has this authority. And it's going to be by Christ, not him. According to the faith of God's elect. And the acknowledgement of the truth. Which is after godliness. Okay, the truth is that Christ has done everything, that everything that you've been told is a lie, that Satan and, and all your good works mean nothing before God, because Christ has done it all. He had to do it all because we couldn't even done the least of it. Okay, in hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began. And this is crazy. Um, see, Christ is the word. And when you give somebody your word, it's a promise. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God. I want you guys to know that the, the promise is Christ. So the reason God could even create knowing what was going to happen with the fall is the fact that Christ was crucified in the, in the eternals before ever creation happened. So that everything that was done after that was in his grace. We see the fulfillment of that at the cross. He's the, and then we're going to see it again at, at his return. But it's going to be the same. Alpha, Omega, beginning and end. The same judgment then is the same judgment at the end. And then at the middle of the cross. I mean, everybody gets caught up in these dispensations and the eons and, you know, all this stuff. Um, it... it that's cool and the dispensations are neat because it shows you how God has dispensed himself in order to reveal himself to us and so that we could perceive Christ being the Messiah. But the dispensations themselves are only a part of the whole and they're not an end-all be-all. I mean, there's so many people that don't believe you're a Christian if you don't know the dispensations. And it's like, Really? But anyway, I'm getting wordy again. But he says, But hath in due times manifested his word through preaching. See, this is crazy. I mean, and it's kind of weird to understand that preaching is the power of God. Because what you're doing is you're preaching righteousness. You're preaching reconciliation. You're preaching the, the what fills people. Okay? And like I said, Righteousness purges sin. So that's why each of us, we just keep reminding people and showing people and telling people about how great Jesus, what he is and what he has done and how he's done it so that people may be free. Because it's just funny that God uses preaching to save. It's just the weirdest thing in the world. Um, and it manifests. Okay. Which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. And this is, this is pretty cool. To Titus, my own son, after the common faith, which the common faith is everybody pointing to Jesus' performance. Everyone that says they're Christians and they go to their denominations and look at the Baptists right now. Holy crap. So much so much sexual deviance in the Baptist community right now. Oh my God. You guys need to check that stuff out. The Southern Baptist Convention. It's crazy. Okay. But everybody has all these different gods according to their conception and according to their statements of faith. Most people don't even know they're saved. 
because they're still judging themselves by their own performance as the evidence of their salvation. And they're being taught to do so by the satanic system that we call the church today. See, if somebody was godly, they would be pointing to Christ's performance as the evidences of your salvation. If he is risen, so are you. If he's ascended, so are you. It's all him, him, him. Not whether you said the sinner's prayer enough or adequate or right or said it in the right words or you you call God his right name, Yahweh or Jehovah or whatever people think or Yeshua or Yeshua or however you pronounce it correctly because if, you know, it's just, it's so funny that people, they break down all these different thousands of things as to why you're not saved unless you do things like we do. Starting from the gospel says you must believe like I did in order to be saved. It, it is absolute corruption. Anyway. Okay, for this cause left I thee in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in, this, in every city as I have appointed thee. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. And this is very important, because all these ones, they're falling short, it's because they're not abiding in Christ. They're not inside of his holiness. They're not, they're not a rock themselves yet. See, for me, when I was a young Christian, I, ha I, I was gifted in teaching and gifted in understanding the word, and I saw these things, but I was not self-controlled. I was self-willed. I wasn't temperate. I was self-willed. I was still trying to prove to myself that I was a Christian. I was still, I was still back and forth, and I didn't know whether or not do I look at my works or his works or whatever. It's it's eventually you, once you find somebody, it has to be stable, and and once people are stable, you can't unsee the truth. Once you see the truth, you can't unsee it, and the truth is what causes that stability. But let's go ahead. He must be blameless, not self self willed, not soon angry, not given to wine. No striker, not given to filthy lucre. And anyway, that's money and, and gain. You know, people patting you on the back. Oh, I'm not accusing the pastors today at all. But a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, and temperate. And this is what I was just kind of talking about. So a lover of hospitality, it's, it's always about welcoming people. Um, a lover of good men, you know, he surrounds himself with men who are faithful as well. Sober, just, holy. And this sober means aware of the mission at hand and on task. Just meaning that he is abiding in Christ, using his uh, victory, relying on it. And that's called faith, by the way. That he's holy, being filled with the Holy Spirit. That he has no lack, nothing. He's not trying to, to appear righteous. And he's temperate, meaning that he's he's even keeled. You know, and I'm not saying that's all the time, because even me, I've got a hot temper. I mean, you know, sometimes you know, it, it's you can't be. It's just a general rule that you're you're. This is where someone who is, who is. Because you, you can't take everything literally, otherwise you'll never do anything. You, you'll be so frozen because nobody measures up perfectly. But these are the things that this, this, these people are, are leaning into and trying to obtain. Okay? Holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine to both exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Okay? For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. And the, the circumcision, I want you to see, these are those that are the religious. The ones that, are, that really are really focused on outward performance. The ones that are teaching you to look at yourself for evidences of salvation. They think they've done something. So they, you, might, you have to believe like I did. Back then, they had to be, you had to be circumcised like they were. Today, you have to believe like they do. 
You got to accept like they did. You've got to receive. You've got to blah, 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 blah. Everything that they say to you, like you should do is implying that they themselves have done it. I'm going to tell you right now, I suck. I'm going to point to Christ. I'd rather be judged by his performance than mine. Okay? Okay. Um, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. And so what they're trying to do is make you dependent upon them so that they can get their livelihood from you. See, that's the one thing that always irritates me about the church is that, you know, that we're paying these people to sit around on their asses. I mean, there's pastors that do some things, but it's like big deal. You don't need, you can go have a job. And still know the scriptures well and, and preach and teach and do all the things. You don't, it's just weird to me. I, I couldn't imagine being subject to other people in my livelihood, subject to other people's opinions. I can't, I'm not going to do that. <clears throat> so, one of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. And... He says this witness is true. And he's not talking about the Cretans. He's talking about what was said. You know. <clears throat> Wherefore, rebuke them, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Again, Jewish fables and commandments of men. Or do you want to trust in Christ's victory? <clears throat> Under the pure, all things are pure. That's weird, huh? But unto them which are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. And this again, this is self-righteous. This is people that are denying Christ by their own pursuit of their own righteousness. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient and in every good work reprobate. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, and in charity and patience. The aged women likewise, that they behave, uh, they be in behavior as becomes holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. They're not going to like this next part. That they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, and to love their children. To be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. The, the marriage is the first expression of your faith. Just so you know. You know, I, you know and everybody says this. Well, if they're just... You know, I'm tempted all the time to look at more. If my wife was just more obedient, I would give her more love. You know, and I withhold love from her because she's not obedient, which is stupid. In the same way that she'll, she won't respect me or honor me unless I'm worthy of honor. But that's according to her own perspective, which is, anyway, weak, shall we say. But anyway, we must, we, it's like the word of the Lord is we have to love our wives and our husbands. You have to love them. That's not in respect to your husbands because it's not because they're worthy of it. It's because God is worthy of it. You got to realize that your worship to God is subjecting yourself to a husband's woman. And then to men, you're loving your wives is your, your subjection to God. It's the first level. That's why everything's being attacked. That's why women are, are being taught to be feminist. How the everything, the homosexuality is being pushed. Everything is attacking the marriage and children. Just so you know, because it is the manifestation of the gospel, the first manifestation of it. <clears throat> Young men, likewise, exhort to be sober-minded, in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, and sincerity. Um, so so you're not only are you preaching them, you're living by them. Um, and in sincerity, you're not acting and pretending. You're not being a hypocrite. Sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he, that he that is of the con contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. 
Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters, and to please them well in all things, not answering again, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity, that they may adorn uh, adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. And that not purloining is like pretending to be working. You know, looking busy, but not really doing anything. Spend the time doing, you know, being profitable. Instead of, you know, I see this all the time on the job sites. It's like all these little wimpy dudes they're, they think they're getting they're they're putting one over on the boss. They think that they look like they're doing something that they don't actually do anything. And it's like, oh well, why wouldn't you just do something? You're gonna waste all that time and effort, and be worrying about being caught and all this other stuff. Why wouldn't you just employ that same time to be productive? Because helping your company helps you, me, everybody. You know, it it doesn't make any sense to me. And I, it's just it's just deviousness that are that people always anyway. I just see it all the time, so I know what he's saying here. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. And that's being a good citizen, by the way. It's not being this good, holy Christian. Um, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Now, it's, it, see, a lot of people, you know, they'll say that Jesus isn't God, and you're going, are you kidding me? There's so many scriptures and so many verses you have to just unlook at in order to... Anyway, so the appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's not saying God and Jesus are going to appear. It's God being Jesus shall appear. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. And this is what he's done. It is, this might it always catches people up because it's weird because people don't read or something. But who gave himself for us that he might redeem us. That means that he would. So that he did. Redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a people, a peculiar people zealous of good works. And this is really cool. It's redeeming us from all iniquity. It means that to purge you from all unrighteousness. To fill that hole in you, make you holy. A peculiar people is the holy people. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise you. Put them in mind to be subject to the principalities and powers and to obey magistrates and be ready for every good work. To speak evil of no man, to be no not brawlers, and I I'm guilty of this because I really hate Joe Biden, and I'm really trying to not speak evil of him, but it's almost impossible. Well, and he's just a figurehead. I mean, you know, we all know about the cabal and all that. But okay, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, knowing showing meekness unto all men. You can't really preach the gospel to somebody and be a dick to him. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures. Every one of these. Let's go over those again because that's, I mean. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of our God, our, of, of God our Savior, again, is so our God our Savior, so is, is it Jesus our Savior or God our Savior? Or is God Jesus? Or is Jesus God? Come on. Come on. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to the, his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Whew, so awesome. Which he shed abundantly on us through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, and these things I will, I will that you affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. But avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. Okay. To the young Bible learners out there right now, you're going to be tempted to get into all these these different 
arguments, Arminianists versus Calvinists, which are both bullshit. The ominal, the post you know, you're going to get into all these different theologies, whether it's by grace or by works. You're going to, you're going to work through all this stuff, and it's all, it's kind of cool because it, it, at the end, you'll go, you'll see it's all bullshit, and you'll convince, you'll lay everything on Christ eventually. But right now, if you want to win an argument, all you do is you put it, and I'm not saying to win for the sake of winning, but in order to, to that Christ may be magnified, you just preach him and make them deny it. Don't get caught up in their arguments and say, oh, well, you know, it says, no, you got to do this to be saved. You got to, you're like, whatever. Christ saved me while I was an enemy. He saved you while you're an enemy. What are you, are you going to tell me I'm a liar? He, if, if you could have, why didn't you? Why didn't Paul? You know, you're just putting everything on Jesus and then dare them to deny it. Don't try to argue doctrinally with them. I mean, unless you're unless you're sure you can you you want to get in that place. Is this it's kind of you can other than show it to show that it's worthless, you could probably do that. But <clears throat> those are worthless arguments. You're gonna worry you're gonna and you're never gonna get anywhere. Because they already have their preconceived notion and they're arguing according to the way they've already figured it out and according to the Jesus they want. And they have years and years and years of training in their lies. So you, you, and you're not even concerned about that. So you don't waste your time memorizing that stuff because that's, that's worthless stuff. You don't care. So don't get in those arguments with them. And they're, you're fruitless and meaningless and they detract away from Christ and they put everything on you to your understanding of doctrine. Rather, boast about your understanding of Christ. Tell them and put Christ out there and let them try to fight against him. Don't try to fight their arguments. It's, it's just stupid. Waste of time. A man that is a heretic after the first and second administration. Yep. Is, is after the sur- first and second admonition rejected. If someone won't see it and someone is trying to be a teacher or trying to do this stuff and they won't see it, then you just see it. I mean, that's how it is with the gospel of me. I'll, tell, I'll try to tell you once or twice, but if you can't get it, it's not your time. See ya. Knowing that he that is such is subverted and sins being condemned of himself. And this is the big deal because your efforts at being good to achieve righteousness is you're condemning yourself in order to achieve. See, Satan accuses you. You agree with him. And then you condemn yourself in order to try to achieve righteousness. It's just, it's it's a vicious circle. And this is where hypocrites, that's where their fuel is. And everybody's like, oh yeah, well I, I say what I mean and I do it. It's like, no, you're still operating inside the knowledge of good and evil, which makes you a hypocrite. Even if you're doing what you really think you are, you're still not what you are. Everything you do is hypocrisy because you're trying to achieve righteousness that we just receive. Thank you. Anyway. Now, um, when when I shall send Artemis unto the year Tychicus, be diligent to come, or Tychicus, Tychicus, be diligent to come unto me to Nicopolis, for I have determined there to winter. Bring Zenus the lawyer and Apollos on their journey diligently, that nothing be wanting unto them. Let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses, that they be not unfruitful. All that are with me salute thee. Grace, greet them that love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Amen. Okay. <sighs> I know I'm like a, a broken record in repeating this stuff over and over again. But that's exactly what the scriptures do. It repeats the same thing over and over and over again. It shows the works of iniquity, which produce hypocrisy, or the works of righteousness, which produce holiness. See, the opposite of sin is holiness, (laughs) just so you know. Condemnation is the power of sin. Grace is the power of holiness. Justification. You don't have two natures. I've always heard that saying that we have a sin nature. No, you don't. You have a sinful conscience. You have one nature. If it's governed by a sinful conscience, it will hit that nature and it will produce sins. 
If you've got a cleansed conscience, a righteous one, it'll hit your nature and produce a whole other set of works. You guys got to understand, it is not what you've been told. This isn't a fight against good and evil. It's a fight about fighting life against the knowledge of good and evil. Okay? All right, my brethren. I've gone way over time. Anyway, I hope this helps. You know, just keep pushing forward. If you fail, remember, the only ones that never fail are the ones that do nothing. All right? Get up. Dust yourself off and keep going. Your God is proud. Every time you get up, you keep coming rather than shrinking back in fear and your own uh, iniquity and your sin and you're falling away. He likes those. He, he's proud of the child that gets back up and keeps coming. That's the mark of a man. That's the mark of a strong person is the one that gets knocked down but keeps getting up. All right? Don't conform. Don't be a pussy. All right? All right, God bless you guys and your families. And um, remind people right now, God is not going to be tolerating blasphemy. He's not going to be tolerating this stuff. You, you guys, you got to understand, we're, time's getting short now. I want you to see, God is not going to be tolerating this. I've been, I've been sitting here warning people. I warn people everywhere I go. It's going to come a time when God is not going to, he's going to take this seriously. Okay. Those who are religious, that keep espousing the lie, that are of the synagogue of Satan, professing to be wise but are really fools, you're going to get hammered on those things. It's coming. Um, those of us, if you're, on, you're not on the fence, you're on the fence. You can't decide. You have one foot in religion and one foot in life. you got to pick. Pick one or the other because you're about to... You're, anyway, there's something coming, you guys. I can feel it. And everyone I know can feel it. The, the time is getting short and the gospel has got to be preached. God is not going to deal with false people. He's not going to deal with them. They're going to get punished. They're going to be concluded with the ungodly. They're going to be getting masks, jabs. They're going to be they're going to be uh, going about their works. The churches are filling up right now. But they don't realize that's the synagogue of Satan. The people are going for something. Right now, people are coming because they have need, and the church, the church caused the problem, and and then they're providing the solution. You guys got to understand, they're no different than big pharma or any of these other things that are going on right now. Anyway, God is only going to tolerate it so much, and then it's hammer time. All right, all right, I love you guys. Have a great day. Bye.